So welcome to the third of our FLOSS lectures devoted to patristic metaphysics. After exploring the Greek core of late antique metaphysics and of its formation in Trinitarian and Christological speculations in the two previous lectures by Johannes Zahuber and Giovanni Mandolino, we are now particularly glad to be moving to the Christian East and more precisely to Armenia with today's guest speaker, Benedetta Contin. Benedetta earned her PhD in 2011 from the Université de Genève and from Kafoskari University of Venice under the direction of Valentina Calzolari and Boros Levon Zekian with a dissertation on La version arménienne des œuvres grecques de David l'Invincible, Recherche sur la formation du vocabulaire épistémologique arménien, which was published in 2017 by the Pontificia Institute Orientale as David l'Armenien et l'École d'Alexandrie in the series Orientalia Christiana Analecta. Another fruit of her research on David the Invincible was her Italian translation of David's book of definition and divisions as David l'Invincibile, le definizioni e divisioni della filosofia, published by Officina di Studi Medievali, Palermo in 2014. After holding postdoc positions at Venice as a Gulbenkian fellow, and at the Foundation for Religious Studies in Bologna, Benedetta has been working for the Nine Salt ERC project of Christophe Riesmann at the University of Vienna and is currently working at the same university as the FVF Lise Meitner project Leiterin, besides being the vice president of the Pado Saraxes Cultural Association based at Venice. Benedetta is also the author of around 20 papers on a wide range of topics in Armenian studies from modern Armenian history and literature to art and architecture, but she has especially concentrated on philosophy and speculative Christology. And this is indeed the subject on which she will talk to us today. Benedetta, thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. I am sharing your PowerPoint presentation. Just allow a second for that. Yeah. Here it thank is. you very yeah. Thank you very much, Emiliano. And uh, I I would like to thank also Bishara for uh, both of you for your kind invitation. Uh, I'm flattered <laughs> from your words. Um, so um, today uh, I will speak about. Uh, uh, a topic uh, which was uh, the main topic uh, of uh, my research uh, during my collaboration with uh, Professor Erisman uh, for uh, the ERC uh, Nine Assault ERC project. Um, it's uh, a quite uh, uh, Neg uh, neg uh, neglected uh, topic uh, for um, uh, scholars in Armenian studies, so it's not uh, uh, so well uh, researched. And um, uh, I, I sought uh, to to make a preliminary investigation of the material, so. Um, I, I suggested some conclu or some preliminary observations on uh, on the theological thought, particular of the fathers, church uh, Armenian church fathers of the early eighth century. Um, I'm not sure uh, my hypotheses uh, are convincing, but I will be happy to discuss with you. So in my today's talk, I would like to provide some observation on the Armenian theological approach to the issue of individuality in the period between the end of the 7th and the beginning of the 8th century, mainly because uh, the theoretical advancements gained in this period marked a watershed for Armenian church history and its theological reasoning. In the period between the first decades of the fifth and the end of the 
6th centuries, there are several texts which attest that the Armenian theologians were well acquainted with both Greek ontology and late ancient Greek patristics. Yet there is no trace of sophisticated discussions about concepts such as hypostasis and nature or existence and essence that came to be more and more crucial in post nicene and then post-Chalcedonian theology. Uh, slide two, Emiliano. Thank you. From the seventh century onwards, Armenian patristics developed its own reflection on individuality and personhood, which was influenced by several factors or strands of thought, and namely Greek logic, the late fourth century Cappadocian ontological reflection, and the later theoretical de developments of the Greek speaking post Chalcedonian world. At the first and earlier stage, it was the integration of uh, Greek philosophy into Armenian culture that ensured the reception of several established technical terms and ways of reasoning, which later came to be crucial. This cultural enterprise was led by Armenian lay scholars who starting from the early sixth century established a local educational system that was nourished by a continuous cultural interchange with the Alexandrian philosophical ambience. At the second stage, the late fourth century Cappadocian elaboration on this concept of hypostasis had an impact on the one hand on the Armenian Procalcedonians, as shown by several texts and translations composed from the end of the sixth century in Constantinople or in the regions of Greater Armenia under B Greek Byzantine influence, and on the other hand, on the Armenian non Chalcedonians by the end of the seventh century. Slide three, please. On a third stage, Post-Chalcedonian theories of individual nature and any postatized individual stimulated the inception of more sophisticated ways to explain the hypostatic union out of two natures in response to the pro-Chalcedonian parties within the Armenian church. The influence of this approach is strong in theological text produced in the early 8th century as I will show later. Slide three seeks to provide an overview of the main texts that discuss the question of the incarnation by applying the philosophical terms and methods at different degrees of intensity. For my purpose, I will focus on two texts among those mentioned here that I put in bold characters, and namely the Book of Beings, and the first uh, letter uh, composed by Hosrovic, the translator. Uh, Emiliano, can you go back to the uh, slide two, please? Finally, among the factors that contributed to theoretical advancements in the Armenian conceptualization of individuality, we should consider another element. Historically, it represents a later development of the first factor, and namely the acculturation of Greek philosophy to Armenian world, but needs, however, to be treated se uh, separately for its paramount importance in clarifying when and how logic and ontology began to be considered not only as philosophical tools, but also and foremost as a theological devices. This methodological and concept, conceptual osmosis between a philosophy and theology was made possible thanks to the progressive Christianization of the philosophical and rhetorical syllabus established by lay, lay scholars along the sixth century. By means of this endeavor, the trivium was completely absorbed by the church 
generating thereby substantial transformations of the classical curriculum and ensuring the religious dominance of the domain of higher education in a long-term perspective. Uh, slide five, please. Mm, yeah, this one, thank you. <laughs> In this respect, we have two historical witnesses which are worthy to be mentioned, for they depict the parable of that process of religious appropriation of classical education that developed along the 7th century. On the one hand, the 13th century historian Stepano Sorbellian tells us that at the time of Catholicos Abraham Arbatanitsi, 605-620, there had been a growing demand for education and training in fields of knowledge where the Greeks were believed to excel. On the other hand, slide the six, the 10th century historian Hovannes Drashanakertsi praises his homonymous predecessor's education in the field of philosophy by stressing his acquaintance with classical and post-classical logic. This enterprise was meant to sustain a provision of philosophical and especially logical training for the upper clergy. Even so, the historian's accounts should be treated with ca uh, caution. It is, however, significant that their records are proved by several theological sources of the 7th century, showing an increasing famili uh, familiarity with philosophical terms and methods when it comes to Christological arguments. One of these uh, textual witnesses is an eclect eclectic collection of pseudepigraphic, philosophical, and theological compositions that the Armenian tradition partly ascribed to the sixth century philosopher David the Invincible. This collection contains a varied, short, and still neglected com commentaries of exceptional interest, such as, for instance, two long interdependent texts uh, respectively entitled the Book of Beings and Questions Addressed to the Heretical Diophysites by the Holy Armenian Church Doctors, Mopses and David. The former is a compendium, namely the Book of, uh, of Beings, is a compendium of philosophical knowledge that was composed for a target audience, most likely dogmatists and rhetors. Although it's a technical content, the purpose of the book is visibly related in some sense to Christology by the choice of discussing crush, uh, crucial terms such as nature, substance, and form, as well as of dealing with the intersectorial concepts such as person, energy, activity, generation, corruption, potentiality, and the soul's passions. In this respect, we can advance the hypothesis that the Book of Beings was used as a sort of handbook for future dogmatists, um, uh, um, embodying a stage of transition from using logic and ontology for philosophical reasonings to using them for theological purposes. Apart from, from spelling out the difference between a nature, existence, and substance that calls into question the scholarly opinion that the Armenian Church Fathers of the first millennium would have not put forward a clear demarcation between such terms. So, apart this, the author of the book seeks to introduce a distinction between person in Armenian dem, and in Greek prosopon, and the hypostasis, by means of Aristotle's metaphorma theory and of the notion of accidental and distinctive properties that ultimately relies on Porphyry's theory of individuality. Even so, 
uh, not clearly spelled out, the author has in mind a twofold way of conceiving of the term person, as shown by, by the introduction of several new compounds that are uncommon and not attested in, early theolo in earlier theological works. At the very beginning of the questions of the um, can you scroll the slides, Emiliano, please? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you. At the very beginning of the question answer text that I choose to enter on the slides, the author of the book marks off the notion of former recipient person from that of formless person, without, however, clarifying the uh, rationale of this division. In my view, the first distinction between a formless and a former recipient person suggests two possible and even complementary readings. In the first case, we can assume that the term former recipient person refers to the most specific kind of species, that is, the individual while a formless person merely denotes one member of a species, which is identified by the essential properties or qualities that it shares with the other members of the same species. But is not marked off by any distinctive characteristics or hypostatic idioms. In this case, formless person could refer to the total sum of all the hypostases that belong to a species. According to a second interpretation that reads our passage in light of Aristotle's matter form theory, the concept of former recipient person comes to denote the former matter compound, which by receiving some distinctive, distinctive properties, becomes a concrete particular instantiation of the common nature. Instead, formless person should be considered as the subject or substratum that is the matter of the composite, composite subject man. By using the term formless person, the author of the book intends to describe the material constituents of man, that is flesh and bones, in which form he inheres or of which it is predicated, as far as the form is not essentially predicated of matter. By contrast, the formless person uh, so a formless person turns out to be a not yet qualified individual, lacking its todeti forming function that is constituted by, by its essential form, as well as by its accidents. To complicate the things, we read in the next, uh, so, so in two slides, not the next one, yes, this one, thank you. We read at the end of these six excerpts that a person is a this such and what reveals the characteristic idioms, characteristic idioms where the author uses a not yet exploited term, Arantz in Armenian, Arantz Nakan, Arantz Nakank. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the question now is, um, what kind of person is the author of the book speaking about? What is the relation between a person defined as a this such and the bearer of characteristic idioms and the person defined as former recipient? That the author uses the unusual term Aranzanakan Aranzanakank 
to clarify the notion of person shows that he does not intend to refer to something of unqualified. Arantz Nakan has in fact the same root of the abstract noun, Arantz Navorutyun, that uh, so at the, first, uh, at the first view correspond to the Greek idiotetes and can be therefore interpreted as a synonym of atkutyun in Armenian proper feature. By using the term Aranzanakan, the Armenian author gives the impression that he relies upon the Cappadocian reinterpretation of the Porphyrian thesis of individuality as a bundle of properties. According to Gregory of Nyssa, individuals of the same species differ from each other due to a bundle of properties such as, for instance, paternity or body size. This set of distinctive characteristics is a set of accidental properties according to Gregory's reinterpretation of a Porphyry's theory of individuality. A direct influence of Gregory of Nyssa on the author of the book cannot be excluded at all. Yet it should be also so taken, taken into consideration the contribution of David the Invincible's commentary on Porphyry's Isagoge. So once again, Greek philosophy filtrated through Armenian vernacular philosophical schools. With respect to David's commentary, however, the author of the book, sorry, I couldn't uh, um, mention, quote, uh, David's commentary because of, uh, yeah, because of time. <laughs> I have not enough time to, to delve into this question. So with respect to David's commentary, however, the author of the book moves a step forward by using the novel term Aranznagan, that is meant to indicate accidental particular that is a particular instantiations of universals in non-substance categories, such as, for instance, the category of quality. For example, the, the classical example is the boldness of Socrates, for instance, equality. In the above mentioned passage of the book, the term Aranzanakan therefore shows a set of particular exemplifications that is unique to the individual substance in which it inheres and is not repeatable elsewhere. It reveals the states that particular substances are in when they instantiate that state. Insofar as, for instance, a bald thing is not, is not only a de de determinate severity of baldness, but a particular instantiation of such a degree. What makes it particular is that it has a particular substance, an X individual as a cons constituent. By endorsing the revised interpretation of Porphyry's theory of individuality, the author is confronted with the reception of Porphyry into his native language and finds that a change is needed in the way of predicating the, the individual. He introduces, therefore, a lexical element that makes sense of the distinction between proper features, so at kutyun, or a took, and a particular instantiation in an X individual. To summarize, when speaking about a person as a this such, and what reveals the characteristics, the characteristic idioms, the author refers to the former recipient person as what is constituted of the characteristic features whose assemblage will never be found in any other member of the same species. The concept of formless person is most likely used for describing the substratum of any living being. 
In all likelihood, by using formless person, David means a composite of material parts then that, when receiving its proper form, becomes a new matter form compound. By contrast, the notion of a form recipient person, that is the new matter form compound, means either all the members of a given species or the individual. The latter comes into being when some non-essential accidents or accidental properties in here in the matter form compounds. To appreciate a further development of the Armenian approach to the problem of individuality, I would like to quote an excerpt from, from one of the letters composed by Khosrovic. Emiliana, can you scroll the slides? Please. Yeah, it's not this one, it's a slide number uh, 13. Again. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, Hosrovic was one of the most uh, intimate friends and collaborators of Catholicos Hovano Votsun. So we are at the beginning of the first half of the eighth uh, century. By drawing the fourfold, uh, do we have uh, enough time? I can. Uh, can I read the, the text? The, 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 the other one, the 13. The previous one, Emiliano. Sorry. Yes, of course. Sorry, I, I couldn't I couldn't unmute myself. Yes, please go on. There is time. Yeah, Plenty so, of time. Plenty of time. Okay, so um, can you show the slide, uh, the previous slide, please? No, down. <laughs> Again, another step. Yeah. So Khosrovic uh, says that the names which are applied over beings, qua beings, are fourfold. Universal, whole, considered as a whole, individual, and singular. Thus, leaving aside the discussion of the others for the time being, I shall say a few words about the singular. This will be useful to understand the ideas that I shall propose. And uh, the other slide, the next slide. Singular is what is called out of these features, land, parents, quality of appearance, activity, and passions. Any singular is therefore separated from the common by all these features whose collection is not seen at once in any other singular. Thus, shouldn't we affirm that we find all these features which are proper to the body in our Lord the Savior? And these are as follows. As for the name, he is called Jesus Christ. As for the place of origin, Jesus of Nazareth, by having the Holy Virgin as parent, and as for quality, the likeness by which he knew the others and was known, as for activity, the evidence that he performed the wonders among men, as for passions, the fact that he was baptized, crucified, and buried, and by the fact that he resurrected after three days and ascended to heavens and those things that followed. So, uh, by drawing the fourfold distinction of the names by which beings are called, Khosrovic relies once again on Porphyry's theory of individuality, as found in his introduction, but also on the Book of Beings and David the Invincible's commentary on Porphyry's Isagoge. In David's commentary, we read, 
for a particular, and I quote, for a particular word is one thing and a singular is something different. For a particular is indeterminate, for example, a man, and the singular is a determinate, like Socrates or Plato. The Armenian term for singular, Yurakanjur, used in the Armenian version of David's commentary, is the same word used by Hosrovik, so Yurakanjur. In this in the slide we I uh, I read before. By applying it. By applying a Porphyry's theory through David's interpolation to his theological reasoning, Khosrovic denotes, Khosrovic denotes an instantiation of such and such. Benedetta, we cannot hear you anymore. Yeah, now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, there was an interruption. No problem. So maybe I restart from the end of the quotation. So the Armenian term, yeah, they, they use, so we saw, I, I, I tried to show that uh, in David's commentary on Porphyry's Isagoge, there is, uh, he uses the term Yurakanjur for singular, which is the same term used by Khosrovic, by the way. By applying uh, Porphyry's theory through David's interpolation to his theological reasoning, Khosrovic denotes an instantiation of such and such a kind, that is a man, by the term individual or person, while a concrete instantiation of such and such a kind by means of a set of particular properties is defined defined by a this such, which is a synonymous with Aranznavurutyun distinctness. In more general terms, Khosrovic considers that a nature is realized in a plurality of individuals, in that it shows that what is ontologically common to all the members of a speech, species and namely their essential or substantial properties. In this case, Khosrovic uses the term person to define a reality as referred not to a variety of individuals or instantiations, but to his, her, its common nature. As regards humanity, person is spelled out as what lays above man simpliciter that includes all his sensitive parts. The foregoing definitions provided by Khosrovic suggest that the term person expresses the individuated entity of such and such a kind, uh, of such and such a kind without its accidental properties. That is, it means any member of a species and not yet characterized by a unique bundle of properties. On the other hand, a nature is realized in one determinate individual, which is a reality constituted by the universal essence accompanied um, by the universal essence accompanied, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> by the universal essence with a set of accidental properties whose collection is never seen at once in any other individual of the same species. In this respect, Khosrovic uses the terms the, a this, such, and distinctness in an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented way with respect to his Armenian peers, 
but shows a certain obvious affinities with the author of the late 7th century Book of Kings, ascribed to David the Invincible. And then uh, I put the last, uh, uh, the, the very last slide. Emiliano, the next one, please. Yeah, you see here uh, a very telling definition of, uh, of Jesus Christ made by Hosrovic. At the end of this quotation, uh, he says, and he who had the timeless common nature and the distinct and particular person from the Father, the same also became a man endowed with nature, person, and distinctness according to time. So, uh, thank you very much for your attack. We would uh, like to discuss with you all what I said, and uh, I'm grateful for your attention.